Hi, this is Emily Saliers from Indigo Girls, and you're listening to Rainbow Country. The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the producers and or the persons appearing on the program. Today on Rainbow Country, in Hour One, a spotlight on Canadian jazz artist Mika Barnes, who joins me in conversation to talk about his 2020 number one jazz album, Vegas Breeze, and more. Plus, Rainbow Country contributor, long-term HIV survivor and activist, Colin Johnson talks about the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic as Ontario goes into a second state of emergency. And in hour two, music from LGBT artists, independent artists, plus voices that you know and love in classic disco, classic 80s, classic house. Stay tuned for Gay Talk Radio right here on Rainbow Country. Hi, this is Carol Pope. Hi, I'm Garrett Conley, author of Boy Erased, a memoir. Hi, I'm Lorraine Segato. Hi, I'm Gord Depp of the Spoons. You're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. Hello and welcome to another episode of Rainbow Country. As I like to call it, a little gay radio show working to give voice to the LGBT community and beyond. And as always, I am your tour guide through Rainbow Country. I'm producer and host, Mark Tara. By the way, Rainbow Country originates from CIUT FM in Toronto, the sound of your city. And now proudly in syndication on nine stations across Canada, including... Bombshell Radio, Love Your Indie, a 24-7 streaming outlet. And Real Music, Real Ideas, Real People, CKUWFM in Winnipeg. The Juice, CJUCFM in Whitehorse. The Mighty, CKCUFM in Ottawa. The Voice of the Halliburton Highlands, Canoe FM in Halliburton, Ontario's Cottage Country. Located in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, CFCR-FM. Newfoundland's only alternative, CHMR-FM in St. John's, Newfoundland. And the latest station to carry Rainbow Country, proudly broadcasting to Kingston, Ontario since 1922, CFRC-FM in Kingston. So whether you're listening in the Yukon, the Prairies, Ontario's Cottage Country, Southern Ontario, down to Buffalo, New York, the Maritimes, the East Coast of Canada, in Newfoundland, or online, it's because of you tuning in, streaming, downloading, but ultimately listening that has taken this little gay program and made it into a syndicated radio show and a number one LGBT podcast. And last week, Rainbow Country was number three on Potomatic's gay and lesbian chart. So today, in Hour One, a spotlight on Canadian jazz artist Mika Barnes, who joins me in conversation to talk about some career highlights like his 2020 number one jazz album, Vegas Breeze, his time with the iconic Canadian a cappella group, The Nylons, and more. Plus, music from LGBT artists, independent artists, plus voices that you've come to know and love in classic disco, classic 80s, classic house. But up first, Rainbow Country contributor, long-term HIV survivor and activist, Colin Johnson talks about the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic as Ontario goes into a second state of emergency. No one predicted this. I checked. No astrologers, no, none of the psychics, nobody predicted this virus. We're caught in something that, yes, has never really quite happened uh, in our communities, in our, in our world before this. However, 
we do have the mechanisms to deal with this. I myself, I'm a long-term HIV survivor, and I think that has prepared me to deal with this in many ways better than most. I have my Netflix, I have prime television, I have shows, I can catch up on work that I've been putting off for quite a long while. But I think it's key for us to love yourself and to start from that in order to deal with being able to stay in. We need to acknowledge that there is so much information coming out. We need to be able to select, find and listen to the experts, the scientists, the virologists. They are the people who know and understand how viruses work. We have to thank those who have been steadfast in taking care of us, the frontline workers. But I also think that we need to understand that we have to be able to work together to get through this. Families, friends, YouTube, all of the social media things that we have now make it, I think, a bit easier to deal with what has been going on. And hopefully for the rest, everybody else, it makes it easier for you too. I'm lucky, my rent is paid, my utilities are paid, so I don't have those concerns, which I know are affecting so many families right now. But we live in Canada, and we will get through this. Following, listening, being careful, adhering to the things that we hear so much about. But I also think that we are getting bombarded by so much information. It's almost information overload. And that can have debilitating effects on what and how we deal with this. So again, restrict yourself to just so much information a day regarding this virus. Follow the experts. Listen to your heart at times, because that is so important. My name is Colin Johnson, and I can be contacted on Colin H. Johnson 1 on Twitter. Thank you so much for your time. Bill 7. To ban discrimination in employment, government services, and housing based on a person's sexual orientation was up for a vote at Queen's Park. Most NDP and Liberal MPPs supported the bill, but without some progressive conservative legislators' backing, a divisive split could rack the province. Four PCs decided to break party ranks to vote with their conscience and support Bill 7. Cabinet Minister and MPP Dennis Timbrell did it to show solidarity for his beloved brother, the well-known drag queen, Rusty Ryan. And for me, a gay politician who was not yet out, I had to take a stand. We were known as the Gang of Four. I'm former Cabinet Minister and MPP Phil Gillies. The date, December 2nd, 1986, when LGBT rights came to Ontario. Hi, I'm Saida Garrett, co-writer of Michael Jackson's Man in the Mirror, and you're listening to Rainbow Country with Mr. Mark Tara. Up next, a spotlight on Canadian jazz artist, Mika Barnes. That's life, that's life, that's life, that's life. That's life, that's life. That's what people say. You're riding high in April, shot down in May. I know I'm gonna change that soon. When I'm back on top in June. That's life. That's life. Funny as it seems, some people get that kick stomping on dreams. Don't let it get me down, cause this old world keeps on spinning round. Been a puppet, a pauper, a pawn, and a king. I've been up, down, over and out. I know one thing. Each time I find myself flat on my face, pick myself up. And get back in the race That's life I can't deny it I 
thought of quitting, babe, but my heart wouldn't buy it. It didn't think it was one single try. You know I jump on a big bird and I'm fly. I've been up, down, over and out, and I know one thing. Each time I find myself flat on my face, I pick myself up and get back in the race. Oh, that's life. Oh, I can't deny it. I bought a cutting out, but my heart wouldn't buy it. If there's nothing shaking, come here this June. Mika Barnes, hi, how are you? Oh, Mark Tara, how much do we love you on our radio? Oh, thanks. Your but voice, how are you doing? How are you I'm doing? I'm great. I'm great. But first, your voice, your taste in music, the awesome graphics, the sense of social media celebration. Honey, you're doing it all for the people, and we appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Thank you for being here to have your voice, your story be heard by the LGBT community, Mika Barnes, and beyond, especially when it comes to your current album, Vegas Breeze, your number one iTunes Canadian jazz album, over half a million streams. How does it feel to have a number one album on your hands? We are queering up the showrooms, baby. (laughs) You know, it it does feel good, partly because we released in the middle of the pandemic and it was an uphill battle in anybody's estimation. But the music seemed to give people, the music seems to continue to get people dancing in the kitchen. And like, what is music for? You know what I mean? When we're, when we want to celebrate or when we're feeling blue or when we just want to like have a song that's like our jam for that day, I wanted to create a record, a recording with, with enough variations in mood. It's all still in the world of the classic showroom, but that is a very wide and broad world as I discovered putting this record together. So it does feel really, really good. And to, be, to put it out and have it be embraced, listen, I couldn't be more happy. This is your second consecutive number one jazz album. Your first was New York Stories. Uh, two consecutives, back to back. Again, thoughts on that? Did you celebrate that in any way, shape, or form? You know, thank you for that. Um, I don't know. Have you I thought? Have, have you, you thought know, about that? I, I haven't. Um, I think, like most artists, I have my I have my nose to the grindstone yeah. for what I have to take care of right in front of me. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'll tell you this: I found a team that helped me create the momentum on New York stories. And I was smart enough to go back to that team. I made some changes, but you know, the social media team, the engineer on the album, my musicians that I worked with. And also, um, you know, I really wanted to get as deep into the Vegas world on this album as I got into the New York jazz world on that record previous you know so in some ways i think if you do the work as an artist and you really dig in for yourself then you know when it's release time you can get a nice surprise like that and um 
being embraced in that way on the charts is helpful to a career because, of course, you know, when they're booking a festival or something, they, they're looking at your chart numbers. And I mean, that's every single person that bought that album, downloaded it, saved it on Spotify or ordered a hard copy. It's like it belongs to all of us. Yeah. And your social media campaign, when it comes to getting the word out about this record was on point, I will Thank say. You. Thank you. Giving the audience, giving your fans a behind the scenes look. You're recording the horn section. You're recording this. You're recording that. You're on the street. Yeah. Who was responsible for that? It's going to sound horrible when I say I am, but I am. <laughs> Good for you. I mean, I work with a team. You know, I have people that I work with. It's not just me. But you know what it is? I always say this to artists when I'm, when I'm coaching a fellow artist in career strategy or something. I'll say, nobody's going to know how to tell your story better than you will. So you might hire out, you might, you know, contract out some of the work. You may not do all the camera work or editing or graphic work. Like you may not be the person who can do all of your production around social media, but you're going to know what to focus on, what story you want to tell. And in this case, I really wanted people to feel the excitement of, you know, if New York Stories was a late night jazz club where you open up the door and there's smoke and, you know, reefer and people are, you know, <laughs> people are acting crazy and the band is funky and doing their thing, you know, late night New York. Oh, you know, that feeling is what I got, wanted to get on that previous record. On this one, I wanted people to feel the door swinging open on a showroom 1963 mika barnes is on stage horn section girls sizzle hot fun and also the swagger of an entertainer and that's that's really how i crafted this album so the socials needed to reflect my personality on stage if mika barnes was suddenly catapulted to 1963 and it was in a big showroom and so I wanted to sort of tease people on, well, what would that be like? Mm -hmm. When it comes to the sound of Vegas Breeze, mm. uh, the sonic landscape of this record, how would you say to a listener, how would you describe the sound of this record? I'd say it's big, swaggering, and confident. Um, now, listen, I'm like everybody else. I got lots of, you know lack of self-confidence, lots of vulnerability, you know, lots of just being, you know, nervous and anxious about my place in the world. I think, I think every queer person does, you know, at some level we wonder, are we going to be okay? Are they going to accept us? You know? And I looked at the Vegas world and I went like, we were there. We were there all over the place. You know, who gave Elvis lessons on how to be fantastic was Mr. Liberace himself. <laughs> Not kidding. Like the Colonel Parker went, help, my boy's in jeans and no one likes him. What can we do? And Liberace brought him around. And, and from that point forth, Elvis toured in loud, fantastic clothes. And he started to become the mythic Elvis that we see and remember. Um, but the reason I put that, the sound as swaggery is because this has confidence this is a man of my standing in the world after having been successful in my industry and really kind of dealt with the demons that kept me back in the old days. I'm now very confident, quietly very strong. And the music is starting to uh, reflect it in a very empowered kind of way. That's my, that's my thing now. Wow, that's powerful. You know, the music's going to be made of what I'm made of because mm -hmm. I, I was central to making every single note on the record, right? Mm -hmm. So you've had three singles off of Vegas Breeze. Off the top, we heard That's Life, made famous by Frank Sinatra in 1966, an iconic song. Did you have any apprehension when it came to putting the Mika Barnes stamp on such an iconic song like That's Life. Any apprehension about that? What a great question. I am telling you, I, I, I stumbled in like a big fool. 
<laughs> I said to my band, okay, we got most of the album figured out. We got to do a Sinatra classic. We are missing that part of our album, right? Now, part of it is because I grew up on Sinatra, but I didn't like him. I did not like listening to the sound of his voice. I, he just sounds like, he sounds, that chairman of the board stuff, he sounds like an asshole. As a, <laughs> you know what I mean? I would not want to be in a room with that man, but the music that he made was of such a high level and sophisticated quality, like the songs he chose, the arrangements he worked with, and then how he delivered a song. I've caved. I am now a Sinatra person. And I, I, I said to the guys, like, let's try a few of them. And the first Sinatra tune we tried was That's Life. But uh, I said, like, what about a celebration? Like, what about let's celebrate life with this? Not like, well, that's life. Sometimes you're down, man. But don't worry, you're going to be up. I didn't want that sort of dude approach. I wanted more like, we crazy. And life's going to be crazy. And, you know, let's be crazy. Like, I kind of wanted that kind of a twist on it. And so the guys just sped the sucker up. I started singing it. And I was like, well, there's our Sinatra. We're taking care. And then my arranger, Don Brightop, brought in the, the, the horns. And my ladies, which is Ricky Franks, who arranged the vocals on the record, and her darling Miku Graham, who sings with her. The, the, the landscape of That's Life is made up of all those layers, you know? And uh, that was a really big uh, exploration for us. We just exploded into it and went, let's see if it works, you know? One of your singles is When in Rome, I Do As the Romans Do. Talk to me about the music video that goes with that song, because did you go to Rome? Can you even believe my good fortune? So I've started working with the European team, and we're quietly rolling out plans for a European release, okay? And in those conversations, um, I have a PR man on the ground in Europe who said, like, number one, why not shoot in Rome? It's called When in Rome, <laughs> right? And then he said, when you do it, put the lyrics in Italian and like, let's enjoy the European spin. Because, you know, Europeans who love jazz are not used to having their countries and their cities celebrated, certainly by North, by North American artists, right? So that was a fantastic idea. We ran with it. And as people can see from the video, we ran all the hell over Rome. Like, oh, yeah, <laughs> that was crazy. Thing is, and I sweated because it was September. And like, listen, getting to Rome, you know, it's... Uh, we got there just the right time because, of course, by winter, by the end of winter, Rome would have been locked down with the rest of Italy. So we beat the pandemic and we were absolutely thrilled by the way that the Romans embraced us. Like me walking down the street all dressed up is, to them is just a Tuesday, right? They were like, well, who is this? Because there's camera people and all that. But other than that, they're just like, well, he looks like a... You know, people in Rome, when they dress, they dress up. You know, they make us North Americans look like fools. And so that was my whole imagination was like, what if I'm... Pretend I'm Marcello Mastriani from Eight and a Half and I'm walking... Or from La Dolce Vita and I'm walking through Rome and I'm in my own movie. And I just did that for three days while they shot. And then, to be honest, our editor, Carlos Coronado, who is just genius, took the footage and made it work, you know. But one of the great things was I got to pay tribute to Rome a city I'd never seen before. And it's a flirting, cheating song, you know? So it's all about being an international playboy. And, you know, I got to play that role for three whole days. <laughs> uh, so looking back on that experience now, did you really get to enjoy the experience of being in Rome? Or were, were, were you there, guerrilla style, let's do it and get out? You know, I did 
we built in a couple of days in Rome where we weren't shooting and I got some days in Florence as well. So we, bu- we booked a, a, a holiday in Florence and there's a couple of pickup shots in Florence actually in the video that are not actually Rome, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> 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 Just like in the hotel room. I was like, this, this hotel room's perfect. We're shooting more. <laughs> mm. But uh, I will say this. I fell in love with Rome. And so you can kind of see it on my face in the video. I'm like, I love this place. Oh my God, I love this place, you know? And I can't wait to go back. I don't explain I remain enjoying a brew Don't deplore my fondness for fun to door You know how a fun to door can lead to a few And baby when in Rome I do as the Romans do I'm saying farewell to friends And romance drops in from the blue Share more, I beg of you please endure My taking a brief detour with somebody new It's just that when in Rome I do as the Romans do And though from Italy I lie to you prettily Don't think of me bitterly But know that I'm true Except now and then in Rome I get that old yin in Rome And naturally when in Rome I do as the Romans do From Napoli, don't cable me, Napoli, to tell me we're through. I'm once again in Rome, in somebody's den in Rome. Well, pussycat, when in Rome, I do as the Romans, disregard the signs and the omens. When in Rome, I do. We'll be right back. Hi, this is Mo Berg from The Pursuit of Happiness, and you're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. So we are well into 2021. How's it treating you so far? 
We're also well into Rainbow Country's fifth season. And over the course of the last few years, I've had on some powerful and interesting guests that came onto this little gay program to share their stories with us. So, if you happen to be in the market for some new, fresh face masks or face coverings, you may want to check out American-based company Virus Designer Masks. Fashion with a purpose, as I just mentioned, made in the U.S. For every purchase, proceeds are donated to hospitals and those in need. Veronica Welch is co-creator of Virus Designer Masks, and some of the first designs were created by well-known gay designer Marco Marco, and both Veronica and Marco were guests on Rainbow Country. To find out more about Virus Designer Masks, check out their website, virusdesignermasks.com. Hi, I'm Simone Denny, and you're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. group founded in 1978 came to prominence with their 1982 platinum selling debut album the nylons and their remake of that classic song the lion sleeps tonight mika barnes you joined this group in 1990 how long were you part of the nylons for let's see i think it's six years all told and I was lucky enough to join when it was still the three other originals and I replaced original member Paul Cooper, the baritone. So yeah, it was like, it was a th- two albums worth of singing a cappella and going around the world something like six times. <laughs> and so touring around the world, what's what was that experience like for you? Well, I'll tell you that it showed me that in order to be in a successful touring group, we are more like athletes than we are artists. You know, it's right. It's about how you feed your body, what you eat, how much you can sleep, where you rest, because the travel is grueling in a, in a really, in a big act that's constantly on the road. Nylons toured, whether we had a new album or not, our fans, were voracious. They wanted to see the act as much as we could get to them because we were famous as a live act first and then the record second. So once we had hits on the records, that's great. But people came for the live show, which meant we could tour 365 if we wanted to. Um, So I learned as a young man to really, um, to really go very carefully into my um, regime my, you know, my physical, um, my physical health, my vocal regime to make sure that I was in really good voice. Because, of course, two hours of acapella every night is not a small feat, you know. And I know, you know, as a singer, right, you know, you do, we do a long show and then there's got to be recovery time. Well, the next day, while you're supposed to be recovering, you're up at 730 to get on a plane to go to the next city. That's not restful. And so you, so you learn your tricks, when to eat, 
how to, you know, when to eat, what to eat, when to sleep, when to nap, when it's time to go out and see the town, you know, see who's new in town besides yourself, (laughs) you know. But I mean, really, the nylons taught me everything. That was like going to university. That was like a college course on how to be an artist. 2002. I'm there. Barry Harris, Chris Cox. Yes, sir. Thunderpuss. Mm. World-renowned producers worked with the likes of Madonna, Whitney Houston. Hello. Hello. You had a number one Billboard Club hit with the track Welcome to My Head, co-written by those guys and yourself. does having a number one record impact change one's musical career? So for me, given that that was my first chart success post Nylons, it gave me a lot of confidence. Because, you know, even artists who are mid-career, because I wasn't a kid when that record came out, I was a grown-up, but I was like, it gives you a confidence because I'd moved to Los Angeles and I'd been touring America as an indie kind of artist, doing my own thing, telling the stories of our experiences as queer folks growing up, what our adolescence was like. I'd made a record called Loud Boy Radio and Loud Boy Radio is an album that Barry Harris fell in love with and my manager gave it to him. At the time, my manager at the time gave it to him, and and Barry said, "I'd love to work with, with Barnes." And so I was like, "Let's do it." And then suddenly, the Whitney Houston uh, song that they took to the top ten, "It's Not Right, But It's Okay," I believe that's the title, blew up, went top ten, and they they didn't stop for five years. So they literally were on the treadmill. By the time they were doing the Madonna mega mix, which at that time, Madonna was the biggest pop artist on the planet. And they were the biggest remixers on the planet. I was so proud of, of the boys, you know, my hometown boy, Barry Harris, and, um, and of course, Chris Cox, both of whom had such a passion for making dance music that really spoke to the dancers. You know, they knew how to work it, work us into a slobbering mess on the dance floor. So when they came to me and they went, okay, we're finally, you know, we finally have some breathing room. We've got a great tune. We'd like to collaborate with you on this. I was like, oh my goodness, it's finally happening. I went in and we, we recorded it really quickly and we started to test it right away. I would jump up in, in the clubs and, and sing it and we would sort of see how it was going. And we began the, you know, all the different remixes and everything, but you don't know you're going to get to a number one club record. Mm-hmm at the beginning of the journey, sure, you know, but with that kind of momentum that Thunderpuss had at that time and with the strength of the record that we made, which was a dirty, powerful, underground, dark house Mm -hmm. record, you know? And it was independent, wasn't it? We were the only, at that time, we were the first act to actually take an independent single to the top of the Billboard charts. Mm -hmm. On that, on that particular, uh, a club, a club hit. And that well made done. us feel really good. Well, they kept playing us in Europe and, mm-hmm. you know, all the important DJs around the world would slip it on because it had a thing to it, a rock and roll vocal, you know, vibe, underground, late night. And um, yeah, listen, it changed my career because suddenly as a solo artist, when you have that kind of chart success, doors open, People are happy to talk to you. Mm -hmm. You know, nothing breeds success like success, unfortunately. It's true. Do you think your time with the Nylons prepared you, helped you for having a number one Billboard hit? 100%. Because the boys taught me, when you have a hit, you will work really hard. So be ready. I.e., have your clothes figured out, have your stage show figured out, know who your people are that you can trust on your team, Mm. you know, your manager, your agent, your PR folks, have that lined up. Trust everybody because your life depends on it. Why? Because when the flight to Miami 
is canceled and you're stuck in Dallas and you, your credit card is maxed out and you still got to get to that show, you need everybody on your team to be willing to drop everything else and make sure that your career comes first in that moment. And that's a weird, that's a weird place to be in as an artist where you're suddenly beholden to a promoter who's paid you money to get to there and you can't get there. You need your team to really work for you. And I learned that in the nylons, right? Hmm. Get the right team around you. Cause we never do it by ourselves. I'll tell you, Mark, whenever I've been successful in my career, I've looked up and there's been a room full of people who have helped me. You know, sure, I can sing, and I love to write songs, and I love working, mu- I love performing music for a crowd. It is like a great pleasure. Making records, I love it. But none of that happens unless people are there to help support you do it. And, uh, you know, that's just a truth of, of success. So, voice, performance career coaching clients including uh, Juno winners Emmy award winners like Tatiana Mislahi from Orphan Black Singers Playground talk to me about Singers Playground and what Singers Playground is all about nurturing my fellow artists from the core that's what it's all about for me you know I think about little Mika I guess I was never really little (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but, you know, imagine, imagine Amika who in my early teens wondering if I could do this, you know, who, what does that kid need? What does that young adult need? What does that mid career artist need? You know, sometimes it's voice class. Sometimes you just need to work your instrument and get free of tension and, and embrace the voice that's there when you remove the tension. And sometimes it's about how to take the stage. I love coaching performance because it's a, it's a bit of a rarity to find a, a performance coach. And I, I just love it when I'm called in for an act that has to take the stage internationally. But I also like working with people from the very ground up, from the very beginning of their careers. And career strategy, you know, it's funny A lot of people have been coming to me to congratulate me for a young artist uh, from Canada that uh, has been nominated for Song of the Year uh, at the Grammys. Um, His name is J.P. Sachs. He's a wonderful songwriter. And people often ask, how long did you continue to work with him? And I always tell them, we continued to work together right up until his signing uh, with Arista Records in New York. Because career strategy wise, you know, when you're in the industry, as you know, you're going to be confronted with something that you're not sure how to handle. Um, And who do you go to? Often our parents are, are not in the industry. You need somebody who's not necessarily on your team, who has perspective and who do you trust? So in J.P. Sachs's case, and in many of the artists I work with, we continue our relationships well past the weekly sessions and, you know, into a relationship that's much deeper and much more abiding. And so whenever J.P. was working out the details for management or agent or et cetera, you know, he would, he would often um, lean on our conversations as a place to kind of bounce things off of me. And so career strategy starts to become um, supporting my fellow artists as much as I possibly can, because we are none of us here doing it alone. So Mika Barnes from, from piano bars like Roberts on church street (laughs) to playing, to playing the clubs on Toronto's Queen street West with the Mika Barnes band, to touring the world Mm -hmm. with the Nylons, to having a number one Billboard Club hit, to having two consecutive number one jazz albums. The question is simply this. Did you always know that music would be the thing that you would be doing? There was a moment in time where I had two lovers. Now we all know that's a lot of love. (laughs) (laughs) But keeping two lovers happy can be tricky. And they were music and theater. Mm. I, was an, I was an actor when I started out as well. I was training for the stage 
and I was doing a bit of film and TV and I was, I was working as an actor. I had about 10 uh, theater shows under my belt when I went. I, I love music. I'm taking off in the clubs in Toronto. People are flocking to my show. It's, it's going to be tricky to do both. And I had to kind of accept that music was my calling. I was waking up with music in my head. Mm. I was going to sleep with it in my heart. It was my, so I, so I had to let my other lover go. You know, you call up your buddy and say, sorry, I'm getting serious with this other relationship. Mm. (laughs) But you know, I think he took it really well. Because <laughs> we're, fr- <laughs> we're still friends. But aren't you acting when you're singing, when you're performing, when you're on stage? Interesting, you say that. I do get a lot of feedback from people that say what they love about my my performances is that I'm I'm fully engaged, like an actor mm-hmm. from a musical theater piece or something. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, I trained as a dancer. I worked very hard to bring my craft into a place where I was ready to take the stage as an actor. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's a part of my makeup to, to really make the most of that theatrical moment, Mm -hmm. that musical moment and to meld the two. Um, You know, I'm not, I'm not the stare at your shoes jazz singer. I give you a show. Mm -hmm. And that's why Vegas breeze made so much sense this time around. Would you like to, at some point play Vegas? I have played Vegas, and I frigging loved it. Mm-hmm. Was that with the it, nylons? I played it as a solo during the um, Welcome to My Head Club uh, okay. days. Yeah, and it was so much fun. Mm-hmm. I mean, just the swirl of the whole thing, you know? I just loved it. Um, so would I go back? In a heartbeat. In a heartbeat. <gasps> the title track, Vegas Breeze, how did you settle on naming this record, picking this particular song to be the title track? Talk to me about this particular song. Great question, my friend. So we were zeroing in on the final tracks and I realized we didn't have a track that really sort of was an umbrella for the whole album. Um, A title track, if you will. And I remembered an old melody that my brother Daniel Barnes who's a composer and a drummer um, we had worked on years ago um, towards uh, on, when we were working together on a bunch of different compositions and I was like I kept trying it and it was like it was a swing feel and I thought well this might work as sort of a big band swinging Vegas number and I just kept playing with it and then eventually came up with a lyric that talked about the elements of Vegas that I think intrigue both myself and the general public, the idea that you go to Vegas, you take a chance and you play, you're, 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 you're trying your luck and you're seeing if the universe is going to give you a break. Something fantastic could happen at the tables. You know, you could, it's where you take a risk, you take a gamble, but it's also a place where we fall in love. Often people will propose or get married or go there to recommit to their vows. It's a very romantic city for so many people. And then it also has a historic kind of significance in show business in the sense that the great entertainers of the 50s and the 60s, they, they, they filled those showrooms with a sophisticated kind of showmanship. The songs were from Broadway, the songs were from the movies. And uh, the artists crafted these shows based on their personality, their, their charismatic characters, you know? And they were bigger than life. You had to be if you wanted to fill a showroom for an hour. And so this song, Vegas Breeze, pays tribute to all of that. And in the title, it's got a little hint to what I was hoping to bring to the table as a queer person, which is a different perspective on romance a slightly different take on what it is to be an entertainer in a tux and to be taking that male swagger and kind of say, well, what if that male swagger belonged to somebody like me? And if I stood on that stage in a showroom and told you exactly who I am through song, 
So Vegas Breeze reflects all of that. And uh, when I brought it to the band, they turned it into a Bacharach 60s pop tune. Oh, my God. I was like, <laughs> in heaven. I was in heaven, you know? Yeah. I was like, yes to this. And then, you know, mm. when you, once you put Ricky and Miku and Don's horns, I was like, this celebrates just the way I want it to party. Mika Barnes, thank you so much for being on the show. Well said, well done. Love the record. Thank you. You know what? I love talking to you. You're one of my favorite media people. Your questions are awesome. And they always make me feel like I'm actually an intelligent person. Rather than, <laughs> so thank you very much for, for, uh, for the conversation. I really enjoyed it. Oh, you're more than welcome. Thank you. Something blowing in that Vegas breeze One kiss and magically Well, our tomorrow suddenly Became a game for two Come on, let's roll the dice Order something smooth on ice Make a whole sweet paradise Underneath I never guessed you would stay to play all night. The bang gon' swing, the shots gon' ring, ring a ding till the morning light. We're keeping cool by the hotel pool. It's a great big swinging playground. Stars have brought you to me The future's ours if you believe The big dreams can come true So darling, take my hand And we'll wander this wonderland Time to talk about wedding plans Riding on my Vegas Artist, MikaBarnes.com. Hi, I'm singer songwriter Steve Grand. You're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara.
taking us to hour two of Rainbow Country, a new track from Church of Trees and Ra Pruce, featuring Carol Pope, Whirls a Bitch. Hi everybody, this is Gino Vanelli. You're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. So coming up in hour two, I have a three-song house set planned for you. I'll also be featuring two Canadian independent artists, as well as Nona Hendrix, a three-song set featuring her. So stay plugged in, because coming up next, hour two of Rainbow Country. Hi, my name is Joanne Vanicola, and I'm an actor and a writer, and I was first on Rainbow Country with Mark Tara on discussing the massacre at Pulse Club in, in Orlando. Um, I realized how important it was for our community to have a radio station, uh, specifically for our issues, to, to talk about people in, in the LGBTQ community and to provide a, an outlet for our stories, um, to discuss 
uh, our politics, culture, and give voice to the to the issues that matter to us. And of course, our artists and and um, the things that we do globally, and, and talk about culture. And without people like Mark Tara uh, providing a space for this with with a radio show like this, then uh, we wouldn't have that voice. So support, tune in. Thank you. Hi, this is Police Constable Danielle Botno, also known as LGBT Cop, and you're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Terra. This is hour two of Rainbow Country, where I feature music from LGBT artists, independent artists, plus voices that you've come to know and love in classic disco, classic 80s, classic house. So if you stay with me, if you stick with me, I hope you think I'm bringing you music worth hearing. Starting us off, a free song, House Set.
volume, pump up the volume, pump up the volume, dance.
We just heard Steve Silk Hurley's Jack Your Body. Before that, Pump Up the Volume, Mars. And starting off that three song house set, Joe Smooth, Promised Land. Up next, a three song 80 set.
man can love a liar And a woman can love a thief There's a few things, baby You should know about me I've always looked for power In all the lovers I knew But now I know the glory
We just heard "Keep It Confidential." Before that, why should I cry? And starting off that three-song '80s set, I sweat. Those three tracks from an American vocalist, record producer, songwriter, musician, author, actress, Nona Hendrix. Known for her work as a solo artist, as well as being one third of the trio La Belle, who had that classic, classic hit, Lady Marmalade. Up next, a three-song indie set.
the shadows He's getting up on speed Somebody slow, there's a mother down There's a madman at the wheel He swings in his head for the trip He swoops up the counter, connects Until you lend your hand 
I'm taking my stand with a one in the head with a bullet Better than a five in the chest bleeding out Better than to hold for a minute But wanna see my life flashing out Sing it to me, one in the rain Better than withstanding the pain that I'm in Better yet to rise up and call on you, friend If you let me in I'll try and try I'll try and try again We just heard, try, try again. Before that, outstanding. And starting off that three song indie set, burn. Those three tracks from Montreal indie artist Taruz, and by the way, his latest single is Burn, which started off that three song set. For more on this artist, taruz.com. Up next, a three-song R&B set. See, I don't really understand what you expected. It seems we're chasing all those dreams, now I'm neglected. Come up for the weekend, come up for the weekend, just to tell me how much you miss me all the time. I'm begging, I do not want to love you.
we just heard Foo Love. Before that, Honesty. And starting off that three song R&B set, Come Up for the Weekend. Those three tracks from Canadian R&B artist Tessa off of her current EP, Foo Love. You can find out more on this artist at Tessa dash music. Dot com. Up next, one of my original tracks, The Beginning. Inspired by end times, which we seem to be living in. The beginning, one of my original tracks. Don't forget to keep up to date with all things country, rainbow country. Follow me on socials at Mark Tara Music. Would you like to be a guest on Rainbow Country in 2021? Send me an email, mark at marktara.com. The podcast for Rainbow Country is available on all major platforms. The official Rainbow Country playlist is out on Spotify. And everything is hooked up at marktara.com. Finally, I want to take this time to thank you for taking your time to be with me. Remember, stay well, stay strong, stay safe. Hi, this is Emily Saliers from Indigo Girls, and you're listening to Rainbow Country. Mm.